we are in the worst ever, other than the Civil War, social and political period in America's history. And that combined with geopolitical problems from around the world just doesn't give me any incentive to think general equities are going to be a place where one can make a lot of money anytime soon. Welcome back. I'm Nigel Spigel. And right now, if you look just there, you'll see something you rarely see in the wild. A silver Krugerrand and a silver Britannia available at a very low premium. Right now, Silver Britannia and Silver Krugerrand are available at just 450 over spot. That's a premium lower than my shirt buttons. I just left it in the dryer too long. That's right, 2022 Silver Krugerrand and Britannia, only 450 over spot. Call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson, and back with us today is our good friend Peter Grandich from Peter Grandich & Company. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be back with you, Elijah. I really enjoyed our last conversation and looked forward to this one. Definitely, and it was a very positive response uh, from our last interview, so we really wanted to have you on again. And also, to get into, you know, we talk a lot about finances, but we also talk a lot about preparedness on this channel, and I think there's more than just financial preparedness. There's also mental and spiritual preparedness as well, which we'll get into uh, later in this interview. What I wanted to first discuss is you you had a, um, a pretty shocking uh, announcement last time that you were all in uh, financially in gold, silver, uranium, and copper, those sectors there. So can you give us an update on that? Um, what made you so bullish on those sectors and where do you stand right now? So there are a lot of different reasons, I guess, to be very brief and, and, and somewhat limited because it could be, take a long time to explain it. First of all, I, to me, investing is always choosing between apples and oranges. And when I looked at my other choices, uh, the equity market, general equities, bonds, markets overseas, they, they, they still had too much downside risk. You know, it, it, it took making and losing millions, not once, but twice for me to conclude it's not how much I'm going to make, but how much I don't end up losing which will separate me, the winners from the losers. So I always try to find something that I feel, okay, my downside is X, but my upside is a lot better. And compared to others, it's the better choice. So it's not because I you know, believe the world's coming to an end and I need a bar of gold or uh, I, I have copper because the whole world is going to be electrical and uh, it's going to go to $20 a, a pound. Not that. It just seemed to have the right fundamentals. And I do use technical analysis when I'm deciding on an entry point. It doesn't decide the entry point, but if I can get a supporting reason technically to a fundamental argument on the buy and the sell side, I then make those entries. And, and I did that. And I also do it not for the short term. Most people who trade, and I don't want to offend the small percentage that are listening that don't fit this category, but most people that trade have some element of gambling in them. And gambling and speculating to me is the same thing. In fact, I think Wall Street uses the word speculating so it doesn't have to say gambling. And when you gamble, you're gambling to lose part of all your investment. And again, I go back to what I just said to you a couple of moments ago is that I'm more interested in preserving my principal with a decent shot to the upside than taking more risk of my principal, but having some greater upside potential. So those, and if you want to go through them, what reasons they, to me, demonstrated to fit that bill far better than the general equity market, uh, corporate bonds especially, and any really general uh, equity market abroad. Sometimes our markets could be not attractive, but a, a market overseas could be, but I just don't like financial assets in general at, at this moment for most parts of the world. I think it was a bold move and also one that shows your experience as well because it's definitely against what the crowd is doing right now. We're seeing an incredibly uh, depressed 
metal sector. Um, so can you share with our viewers, how are you, um, what insights did you have that showed that, you know, this sector right now and uranium is the place to be, even though it seems like everyone is saying it's not the place to be? Well, that's, believe it or not, right near, if not at top of the list, <laughs> near top of the list but from a contrarian. If anything, I've been described as a contrarian for most of my life from the good words that have been said on the Internet. We won't get into the bad ones. But uh, the other thing that I think is important is, and I think it, even though I've been out of the mining and exploration business for over 10 years, focusing up until most recently on the sports business I was involved in, I still kept my eye on things. And one of the things that was clear even before the pandemic, which really opened people's eyes to what I'm about to say before the pandemic, most people had no idea about this. But we learned in the pandemic and now subsequently with the uh, energy crisis and, and supply side shortages, we don't make or control our own destiny for a lot of different things that we need for life. Uh, food, energy, you know, things of that nature, minerals, things of that nature. And there hasn't been a lot of money spent by the people who look for those things for their livelihood in a long, long time. CapEx spending in the metals and mining industry is continuing to decline. And these things are not only getting harder and harder to find, but they take longer and longer to develop and they're more difficult to develop because of a whole lot of reasons including political risk, which 20 or 30 years ago, you could spin the globe in an office, not even look at it and point and say, okay, we can go mining there. Now, you wouldn't do that because there's a lot of places where mining's become increasingly difficult, if not impossible, whether it's political, environmental, or whole other issues. Uh, and so if you look at the metals that we talked about, all of them have seen a declining interest for a decade or longer at a time when suddenly their usage, if if the bullish people are even half correct, are going to increase dramatically. And uh, none of it is more positive than that and, and really a complete turnaround than the uranium. I mean, just a few years ago, it was politically wrong if you were a politician to talk about, you know, we should build new more nuclear plants. I remember politicians not that long ago uh, saying here in the U.S., we'll never see another nuclear power plant built here again. You know, we're, we're all green and, you know, but we're gonna, you know, solar and wind and all. Well, that's 180 degrees change. Now, uh, when you think about just this and I get just to put an example of, to get down to other levels, why here in the United States, people are dependent just like they are in Europe, even though in a, they're in a lot worse position for nuclear energy to be a key part of providing electricity to run things and to heat us and give us air conditioning in the summer. So we use 50 million pounds of uranium a year to run our nuclear plants. And you know how much the United States produces on its own right about now? Just about zero. So that's just a classic example. And we can go through that through copper and other base metals. The gold and silver fall into a different category, which I think, and I've been speaking about it for, for a few weeks now, uh, and I believe it's going to be a topic which you probably, because of knowing your background, you've discussed, but 99% of the financial world not only is not discussed, most of them have no idea even what it will mean. And that is what I believe is the coming takeover, or at least competition of the BRIC nations and introducing an alternative currency to the US dollar. They have adamantly spoken about it openly, uh, the highest levels in the Chinese government, Putin, the Indian premier, and now as we take today, the president of China for only the second time since the pandemic started has left his country to go visit Saudi Arabia because they expressed an interest of joining the BRIC nations. and. Somebody made this point. I wasn't the originator of it, but they said, if you look at the BRIC nations, these are the energy and commodity nations. And if you look at the Western world, is these are the users and indebted nations. And so I think they have a lot more going for them, and they're going to become a serious challenge to the United States and the U.S. dollar. And if and when that occurs, 
I'm almost certain, I can't never say certain, but I'm fairly certain for myself, I, I bet it, that's as you noted, that part of that introduction is going to include gold, at least, as part of some backing. This is not going to be a completely fiat new currency they introduce, because then they'd be just said, you're just another example of the U.S. dollar. And that's why I think China and Russia in particular, and even India, have been huge buyers of gold and been major, major sellers of our paper. Uh, Russia totally liquidated all its treasuries and the Chinese are getting out as fast as they can. So if you can look past the next week or month and into 20 and 23 and beyond, I think there's a lot of bullish factors, far more. And gold and silver have really been stuck in a trading range for a few years now. Uh, a wide trading range, but nevertheless, a trading range. And the only reason there's a lot of seemingly extra disappointed, Elijah, many of those same people own mining shares and in particularly junior resource stocks, and they've been crushed. And so the savior was going to be this dramatic rise in gold and silver and their shares will do well. And now they frown not only on their shares that have been clobbered, but also the metals themselves. When the metals themselves have done okay, maybe they didn't go up to where everybody said, but they certainly didn't lose a lot of people a lot of money. And people forget again, and I go back to what I said, it took losing and then suffering the mental anguish from it to make me realize that it's not how much I'm going to win, but how much I don't lose, which is going to separate me from you know most others. Definitely. And it seems like we are seeing a lot of people uh, lose and gain right now as we're seeing the volatility in the general stock market. Um, I know last time we had you on, it seemed like I believe it was at the stage of, you know, uh, how low can the stock market go? It already had fallen, you know, 20 percent. Now it seems like the narrative is flipped like, oh, well, how high can it go? You know, we're we're off to the races from here your perspective on where the general stock market stands right now, and are you bearish or bullish going forward? So there in the middle of June, I spoke on my blog about this thing got too oversold too fast. There's too much of one-way thinking. And let me take a step back on that. Uh, I've coined them the don't worry, be happy crowd, but I found somewhere between 51% and 99% of the financial service industry can be tossed off the top of the Empire State Building and they'll all say the same thing all the way down. Hey, so far, so good. They have literally learned how to drive on a one-way street. They don't know what it is other than to have a Fed feeding monetary heroin into their car so we can run down and make all this money in all these stocks, okay? So they, they don't have a comprehension. So anytime there was a decline, uh, they would expect the Fed to bring out the Kool-Aid job, pour it in the market, and go back up. And we all live happily ever after. And that's been their attitude. And so knowing that that doesn't disappear overnight, it, we fell too far too fast not to think they're going to say, OK, this is just another opportunity to do this. And let me make out a very important point, because there's very few people, or as some like to say in the old comments when I was speaking negatively a year ago, that Grandage dinosaur, because, you know, I started back in the early 80s. When I entered Wall Street, market had gone nowhere for almost 30 years. It traded between 700 and 1,000 on the Dow for almost 30 years. In fact, a famous front page of the Business Week uh, read, equities are dead. Literally ended up being right at the bottom of the market. But the mood back then was... There was so many things negative. Uh, guy Howard Ruff had a war room. People, everything was negative. You bought zero coupon bonds at 10, 12, 13 percent. And uh, that was it. And so when the rally started in the early 80s, through up to the crash, which I got my claim to fame because I forecasted and then said, get back in the next day, the retail market was net negative on the market. And then after the crash, they did not be net long until the early 90s, even though it had made up all those losses and then some. Now, what was interesting in this year of decline or 10, nine months of decline, it's retail that basically led this rally up while professionals have been selling. 
And some people saying, oh, they're going to get have to chase this. And, you know, the other word that's tossed around, the Fed's going to pivot. And I'll explain if you like why I don't think it's going to happen the way they think it's going to be. But it's the exact opposite of where we were when this bull market began. So I'm not surprised through the rally. I'm not surprised. Listen, when you had over the counter stocks at a year ago, 21 and 22 year old internet guru sensations were touting we're going from 200 to 2000. When the only thing they really ever struggled with before that was algebra a few years back in high school, they seen it go from 200 down to 20, and now it went 20 to 40, and that's great. Hey, it doubled, but it's still dramatically lower where most people lost money. And a prime example, Elijah, of this is the cryptocurrency market. If we can just look back and replay every day what we heard 24 7 a year or two ago of all and everything and all the experts from Cuban and all these billionaires telling you how this was like easiest money in the world and buy this coin and this dog coin. And everybody seemed to be focused in that world. Two thirds of the money that was in it just a year or two ago gone, is gone and really gone. I mean, some people absconded with it. I mean, that's how bad it is. And yet still there's a cult-like view by mostly people who don't have a lot of experience, who aren't around 30, 40 years, aren't even 30 or 40 years old, that this is just another great opportunity and Bitcoin's the answer and you know it's going back to a million and all that type of stuff. So again, I just think that we saw the first down leg. It was reasonable to see this, but there's an overwhelming negative fundamental factors that I just can't see the stock market doing anything better than holding its own and trading choppy and still have a reasonable chance to still go somewhat lower into next year and beyond, both from fundamentals of economics, but also we are in the worst ever, other than the Civil War, social and political period in America's history. And that combined with geopolitical problems from around the world just doesn't give me any incentive to think general equities are going to be a place where one can make a lot of money anytime soon. It does seem like <clears throat> we've completely shifted possibly to a new um, new period. I mean, that's what I'm hearing from a lot of guests is that the last 40 years have been nothing but up for the stocks in general. Um, but we're co entering a completely new period where, you know, the Fed will not come to the rescue. Uh, can you expand on this? Yeah, so, so, so the thinking is, is that, and the word, just like transitory was hot nine months ago, uh, pivot is the hot word on the don't worry, be happy crowd circuit. And so the, the thought is, hey, they tighten, and then one day they wake up and go, pour the Kool-Aid again, lower interest rates, and that's all good for the markets and stocks go up and all. That might be easy said than done because they say, well, we're seeing demand decline, and that's the key to raising rates. So the Fed's doing its job, and once it's, inflation appears to be softening, what they don't realize is two different things than the last time America faced inflation in the late 70s and into the early 80s. One, this is as much, if not more, a supply shortage issue, which has contributed to inflation going up, which was not the case back then. And two, we were the world's largest creditor nation then. We ain't now. We have, you know, it's hard for me when I think about when I started that I would ever say one day, Elijah, 38 years later, we have 31 trillion, not billion, trillion dollars in debt, not counting what people still expect from Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, which many will argue is maybe two or three times more that totally that government has to come up with that money. And so to think interest rates, if they do go up, even back to 5%, which wouldn't be a dr dramatic rise, given we once had them at 15 or 20, that would be a $1.5 trillion interest expense on a country in its best year ever, 2019, did a little over $3.2 trillion in income from tax revenue. So one of the reasons they went out and hired or want to hire 87,000 new IRS car agents, because they got to keep looking for more and more places to find money because this country just runs 
on deficits. It's uh, it just gets worse. It's uh, it, it 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 the the only thing that was inflation reduction in this latest act was the name. In fact, that name was created so they can get the senator from West Virginia on board. It is not. It's just another printing of money and 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 spending on things we we ill afford. And Elijah, it goes back to, and I know you're open to this, and that's why I'll bring it up. It goes back to going against what this country was once built on. This country was built on, whether you like it or not, it's a fact that can't be denied, on Judeo-Christian principles. And that means biblical. And in the Bible, there isn't one verse that's positive about debt. In fact, there's all sorts of verses that warn about debt. So whether you want to look at it as a historical book or the word of God or somewhere in between, it was a fact that when this country more or less ran itself like that, it didn't face the, the big dire situation now that that book has warned so much about. And so uh, I, I say once that brick situation happens, I, I'm really confident. I, and please, I want your views just because I'm confident doesn't mean it's going to happen. But for myself, I, I hope I live long enough, which means I only think I the good Lord to keep me here for another year or two. We're going to see that. And when that happens, this whole financial world changes overnight and everything and anything, because one of the reasons we were able to get away with high deficits is because we were the world's reserve currency. So if there's a competing one, let alone one that maybe takes us away from being it, uh, then the country is really you know, in even worse shape than some of us think now. And I'm not even arguing yet about the political and social aspects, which are tearing this country apart. I don't think we've been more divided in this country other than the period just before the Civil War than we are now. There's a hard left, there's a hard right. Very hard to be in the middle. In fact, if you're in the middle, you're hated by both sides. So, you know, I tell people, listen, I, I think the left is really destroying the country, but I actually don't want to see uh, Trump again because he's too toxic. Everybody hates me. It's very few people that like me for the reason. But that proves to me that that middle that used to be the fabric of this country, that, you know, there was a time when Republicans and Democrats, I know it's hard for young people to imagine this, but they actually used to work together. It was bipartisan legislation. I haven't seen, I, I hope I'm not speaking on too long, Elijah, but I haven't seen, I deal mostly with small to mid-sized business owners, and they will concur. We haven't seen good legislation on the federal level. I can't speak because I don't know every state, but on the federal level for businesses in over 20 years, everything that's basically come out has hurt or made it tougher to run a small to mid-sized business. And you know, that's been the backbone uh, of the country. And so uh, I, I, I guess that to say to you is the whole idea of the general equity market was at one time when I started, it was a place where you went to buy and sell part ownerships of businesses. That's what it was about. And you, you who was the buyer thought their widgets or their service and all would demand more, make more money, and your shares would come worth more while. And the person who sold it to you think it was enough for them, and, and that's what went on. That game is gone. When you watch that terrible channel, I won't mention it, I call it Tal TV, and their people are sitting there at that exchange, that might as well be a museum. Very little actual trading goes on there. Half the money in the, in the markets these days are in what they call non-active funds. They're not actively managed. People are, are in some sort of index fund that's tracing a sector or an index. And the manager doesn't have to start figuring out which stocks make up these and which should I buy or sell. They have to keep just matching that index. So when the market was going up, it was easy. I mean, it was probably the easiest job on Wall Street at that time. The other half of the money, I'd say 80, 90% of that is divided among different types of people using computer programs. Algo traders just trading on headline news, and based on that, they quickly buy and sell things. So very sophisticated, gamma-related sell options, do this, do that type of trading. The person or persons who would be active in retail, buying and selling because they like ABC company because they have a great new product and all, that's so little of the markets these days. So what I saw when I entered, and now this basically high-tech casino that the financial world has come, 
uh, volatility is without question here to stay. It's just there isn't there's no reason not to with all that type of stuff happening in the short term. And on top of that, and, and this kind of doesn't exactly make the people who have these websites that want to interview people like me when I say this, they're not exactly thrilled about this, but internet and people chatting intraday about markets, authorities, and investors have greatly lessened the time period most people are willing to wait for something to work. Because you're talking about it so much that the expectations just get higher and higher. A bunch of people come on, they're all bullish on this reason. And before the end of the day, they're going, oh, that should be up a lot. You know? So the time frame. And I know that because research reports in the 80s and 90s had a three to five year outlook. That was the standard. You tell somebody three to five years from now, then you crazy. You know, three to five months would be long enough. So there are a whole host of reasons. And I mean, I know the whole question started with, you know, what about the stock market? But there's just not anything really for me on a whole different front that I would want to start. And here's the last comment I'll make. And I'll shut my mouth and take your next question after this. People used to say to me, especially when I was on the management side, hedge funds, mutual funds, hey, you guys on Wall Street, you always tell us when to buy. You never tell us when to sell or sell at a good time. So my standard answer in the last 20 years, because I had to lose millions not once but twice myself to come to this conclusion is, if you can't first buy whatever it is you're in today, forget what you were in it at before or the reasons, but make like today's the first day and you have this money, if you can't bring yourself to buy it and you hesitate, then that's one of your first clues that maybe you shouldn't be in it and maybe you should think about selling it. But most people end up implementing a wonderful spiritual strategy, but the worst investment strategy known to mankind. They simply hope it gets better or I hope it goes back up. They never had a plan to start with. I worked in sports for 20 years. I worked with professional teams. They all had written plans. They had plans on top of the plans. If plans change, what do we do? Most people are investing from their seat in their pants, Elijah. And that combined with the other reasons I told you for volatility is why there's so many swings and why people are getting beaten up because they get caught up in the emotions of the swings and can't put in good judgment. Any type of life decision doesn't have to be about stocks. Any good psychiatrist or hopefully a, a God-grounded person will tell you emotions are, are a bad time to make tough decisions. And and the same holds true in, in, in investing. Now, you've mentioned a few times now how during your career you have uh, gained and lost millions. And I think that's not that's not something, you know, everyone can say. It's very few people who who have that ability then to, you know, remake themselves and, and gain those millions back, having the, the courage to start again. Right. Um, and I think it comes down to, you know, whenever we're preparing for crisis, we've talked about it kind of the dire situation in the financial system with the dollar, with the stock market right now, we need to prepare. But at the end of the day, there's only so much we can do. And there's a lot of unknown right now that we we can't prepare financially for. Um, and, you know, you face this yourself of losing millions, but then uh, making them back up. So what has kept you going when you've been wrong? Well, not having that Fonzie attack, you would have to have watched old happy days and know what I'm talking about. But Fonzie had a problem of saying I was wrong. couldn't say I was wrong. And if you watch almost all the financial programs and these people, you never think they were wrong. You might you say to yourself, I must be the only person that lost because it never seems like these people have lost anything. But they have. Uh, I think the first is admitting that losing is a distinct possibility. I think the other thing and what actually got me into the business, I was a warehouse manager. I turned a small amount of money into a fair amount trading options. And then I got a hold of a penny stock broker, got a hold of me. And within six months, it was all gone. And uh, I started an investors club. And a guy came and heard me and said, you should become a stock broker. And that's how it began. Well, I got over the financial loss pretty quick. But once I learned how that stock broker worked and how he, what he did to convince me and so forth, the mental anguish of losing was far greater than the financial loss. And I don't think to this day that the financial service industry can only speak for in the U.S. I don't have experience with it anywhere else. 
I don't think it takes into account the potential mental anguish they may cause on their clientele. And, 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 and not on purpose, you know, just, you know, just happens. And so I used to have clients come in and go, oh, I made millions in real estate, but my, my friends down at the golf club, they're killing it in options. I want to trade options, but every time I do, I lose money. And, and, and then they get their whole life changes because they've lost. They're not doing well. So I think you have to understand that part of this is you must take into consideration what are my risks. Now, the more I speak, the more I share my views, the more I talk about things, less and less people come through the door, Elijah. They just do. I'm with a planning group. We believe in cash flow. We, you show me a successful business person, especially in real estate, small to mid-sized business, they're going to tell you a great story how they manage cash flow, not their net worth. But we teach cash flow and we teach efficiency how to use money. But the best we can do is turn your Chevy into run it the way the manufacturer made it. We don't try to turn it into a Rolls Royce. But Wall Street operates on that come with us, we go from a Chevy to a Rolls Royce attitude. And every so often, there's a few that do, just like, you know, somebody's going to hit the lottery today, but uh, how many people do that? So I, I just take all these measurements. And then what was most important to me, and it only happened basically in my second half of my career, and it happened after suffering losses, both financially and then dealing with severe depression. Uh, I turned my uh, I turned to my faith, my Catholic Christian faith. It became uh, my foundation and my friends changed the people I was around with and the people I really desired to be around with changed dramatically. Uh, my wealth might have increased, but my desire to own the de things decreased. You know, George Collin does a wonderful skit. It's online. He's been passed for a lot of years and it's called Too Much Stuff. And public storage, who's done nothing wrong, their legitimate great business, should be the poster child for what's wrong with America. Because you can't drive down a major city street for too long before you see a public storage facility. And our parents and grandparents never had them. And they had much smaller dwellings on average. They didn't have all this stuff. So we've been convinced you know, by Madison Avenue and Wall Street that more money equals more happiness more money gets you more stuff that gives you more happiness, et cetera, et cetera. And my classic example is the guy that owns the bus company has to be happier than the guy that drives the bus. When in real reality, and if you ever worked in an inner city or did mission work and all, some of the happiest people you'll ever meet have zero to next to nothing. And if money was just the answer, we wouldn't read all these stories every day of wealthy people doing terrible things to themselves, including the the, 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 the the absolute worst of worst things, taking their own lives when the world told them they had everything, but somehow they couldn't deal with it. So I, I, I think you have to have all that consideration. A lot of people don't want to hear that. <clears throat> In fact, when I formed Trinity Financial, when I first started working with athletes at the beginning of the millennium, the broker dealer I was with said, you can put a rock on the door, you can put a bull on the door, but you're not putting God's picture on the door. So you can have people, which I know, I believe yourself, excuse me, may be a faithful person, uh, but practice in a secular world. Financial service industry is still virtually all secular. I mean, there are a handful of companies out there that openly speak about their faith, but by and large, it's a secular world. And, you know, God stuff is put over here. You save that for when you're, you know, you're in your own life and all. Yet that book, that, that's the found, very foundation of that faith, has more about matters of finance and money than it does about heaven or hell. So it's kind of ironic. And so once I got into it and I understood that and half the parables were about that and King Solomon, which I took the time to study for almost two years, who people say would be worth a thousand Warren Buffetts in today's dollars. He gave out some great advice in that good counseling, uh, surround yourself with people. You can't know everything about everything. And, and that's how I built myself in my life. And, you know, the good Lord uh, has used it now in these latter part of my life to be able to be blessed with an opportunity with somebody like you that would share this. 
I couldn't spend 60 seconds on this subject on a major financial network. Maybe around Christmas time, they may stick somebody on for a minute or two, but that would be it. I think the interesting thing as well is often when we let go of something like our finances and I guess focus first on on God, right? And our relationship with God. If we let go of everything else, often we're blessed abundantly. Uh, we're always, you know, we're blessed abundantly with all those other things. We just can't be attached to that. And I think that goes back to this whole idea of like um, really realizing that at the end of the day, we can only prepare so much and realizing that first and foremost, we have to prepare spiritually and uh, you know, God will take care of the rest. We have to be smart. We have to be prudent. Um, but at the end of the day, we can't be attached to any of those other material things. And you have to do one more thing. And it was the hardest thing for me to do. And I only started in earnest about 20 years ago in it. And I did it long before recuperating the millions again, if you want to look at it that way. And that is tithing. And it's very difficult uh, for people to do so. In the Catholic faith, it's almost not taught at all. My Protestant brethren at least are uh, are willing to speak about it, although there's a certain sect that goes into Christian prosperity where somehow God wants everybody to be a zillionaire. I don't believe in that. I I believe that's uh, actually not biblical. But we need to remember that we're, we're here for a short time, relatively short time, even though we're young. You don't think that's the case. Uh, but we're responsible not just for ourselves, but for others that may be less fortunate. And tithing doesn't always have to be monetarily wise. Tithing is your time, you know, devoting your time to people that need some help. You know, I, I, I don't have to go too far out of my house to find people that are having all sorts of issues, whether it's abilities to get to and from a place, uh, an ability because they're now physically incapable of doing something or struggling with a whole other issues that... Uh, uh, a, a simple word could encourage them to feel different. And uh, that is what I think we, we is the is the missing ingredient for people. So no matter how much they make, and, and that's why in, in the Bible, God shows m- multiple examples of the difference of the lady that just gave two coins, but it was everything versus the, the rich they gave from the Exodus or the rich man that showed up. But once he was told what he had to do, he, he couldn't face doing something like that. I think that's why God doesn't want us to all be Mother Teresa, but he wants us to have a heart like Mother Teresa. And and I think that's what's been the difference for me. And I've noticed everybody that's followed that route, even in the most dire, even financial situations, will come back to me after a year or two and go, wow, Pete, you're right. I mean, everything didn't return back to what it was, but I was at least able to deal with my issues, which I weren't able to do before. And and, and you ask me that, that I think is, the single best investment advice I can give to people, and that's tithing. Definitely. Well, Peter, we really appreciate your time today. If people are interested in finding out more, they can go to petergrandich.com, link in the description of this video. Any last thoughts before we let you go, and can you share with us about your company? Well, we're we're, uh, a planning group that focuses on cash flow and efficiencies. We can only deal with U.S. residents. But I want to tell you, I was looking forward. I watched our last interview and I saw I took the time to read the comments. And it was it was heartening to me that there was a thirst for people out there to hear finance tied with with faith. And so that's why I was not only glad to come on, but that you gave me another chance to share that today. So that's far more important to me right now in my life than anything. Somebody reaching out to us for our service. Thank you for that. And I really hope someone watching this helps them in their life. Fantastic. Peter, always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much and God bless. God bless to you. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by Bankwire, 
ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.